bits. Um, so it involves a Raspberry Pi, Arduinos, big easy driver, and stepper motor. And my lightning talk is a 20 second movie that pretty much describes the whole thing. So, uh, if I can find it. Yeah. That one. That's the one. Want to play? Uh, full screen if you can. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, so the thing on the right. In the middle there is the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino Sorry. and the big easy driver. <coughs> Fire away. <laughs> oh. oh <boy. laughs> it did not get delivered through the window on a crane, so we didn't quite do the James Bond thing. And unfortunately, we did break the same, but in a bad way. The thing started grinding instead of opening up. But it was So is there a microphone or some sort of feedback mechanism to no, get uh, safe, safe? There's a micro switch inside, and um, actually the, uh, the couple of triggers the micro switch every time it goes around. And the way the container works, if you get the combination right, it locks, it jams. So the idea was we just listen to those switches, and if we stop hearing them, we must have opened them. Okay. <laughs> so it's not, not, not really efficient. Well, no, I mean, you, 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 but as soon as you get the right combination, yeah, you should block it and you'll get it. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, we sort of wore up the mechanism before we hit the right combination. That was a design feature to stop somebody brute forcing it. Yeah, it was the best we could do. Um, there are various other, I mean, we could have gotten a, a stepper motor or the shaft encoder and, and found out immediately when the, uh, when the thing stopped moving. But of course, um, the contents of the site should be able to replace the burnt out mode in the same way. Right. Yeah, I don't actually know what's going on anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Sorry, what's the contents of the site? Uh, I don't know, they're up on eBay now. No, um, I think it's backups and shit. Okay. Uh, the problem is somebody said it, and then they said, here's a combination, go and test it, and somebody tested it, and then they locked it, and then the combination stopped working, so I don't know what happened there. But, um, yeah, it was it was an attempt to avoid having to call a locksmith, which we now do. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, bit of fun. This functionality I thought people might like. This is Arduino. We've got a home as a door controller. It's hooked up to a little um, different stripe. It's got some micro switches. Don't have any of this. I borrowed this from Stuart Rivers. Thank you very much. Um, just to get the program going. But it's got HTML in it, right? So you, with Arduino, you hit the button and you. Oh, really. it's going to work. Yeah. And there's a bit of JSON, a bit of JavaScript, so you've got it sort of going back and forth so you can actually lock and unlock the door. Um, sensors, micro switches, free switches, and that. The garage doors are driven by an output just on the electric uh, garage door opener. Now, this is really cool, but the thing is, the HTML eats up quite a bit of space. So, if you look at the. Um, uh, okay, so 67 lines, about 2.1k of the new HTML. That's real. No, from the 3 to 8, that's heaps, heaps of PRAP. So if you look at the uh, HTML, which is the strings of H, you know, problem of HTML, it eats up a lot of space. So I thought, well, hey, why don't I compress it? So here's exactly what your web server at home does. So using a script which you know, copies the stuff up to my server at home, fetches it down, gets the GZIP data, and turns it into um, hex. You can end up with a file. That's called hex. <coughs> And that's the compressed piece of data. So the script basically takes the file, uploads it to my server, pulls it down the wget, does a OC on it, gets the data out, put a C to put all the X characters in. And if you, oh sorry, um, sorry, I haven't done any prep except for make sure I can get this going to show you. So I'm sorry, but and John said I should tell you about this. So it's John's fault. But if I was to you know, compile that, we're looking at on this, which is the mega, which is for heaps of space, I don't have all these. It's 32k, which is well over the 328 limit, right? So I close it again. And, oops. What are the three words? Move it into place as the 
replacement. Open up the sketch. And this time it's actually the hex. Do a verify. And this time that's 29k. So I'll say 3k just in compressing the HTML I'm using on the winner. That you can store, you can store in the, instead of inside of the script itself. And write the flash. Yeah. So that the uh, oh, I'm actually cool. I, I like to I'm moving away from my I haven't done this for ages because I've been doing other things, but um, it's stored in as a it, um prop strip. So it's in Okay, it is. Yeah, okay, cool. So it's cool. just that it eats up programming space, right? I, I don't have much RAM, so I can't store it in RAM. Yeah. Nobody likes to store strings in RAM. Yeah. It's it's program space. Anyway. What's that? If it's in RAM, it's in program space anyway. That's right. Yeah, so I don't want to get it into one place only. Um, so what do you move to? What do I <coughs> uh, Probably STM, um, which is an uh, ARM chip. A lot more space. A lot more time. <coughs> Got my board. So it's like, um, mainly because I sort of hang out and chat with Keith and beat out quite a bit, and sort of it's rubbing off them doing interesting things with non AVRs. Um, Keith likes to bang on AVR a lot. And it rubs off. They use an AVR. Well, well, there are AVR. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <good. laughs> no, we see he's doing a lot of ARM manage on STM, which is much nicer. Anyway, I always want to show you after I actually compile it and send it to the board just to prove that it does actually work. Uh, ah, this will actually fail. And it'll fail in an interesting way. Fermenter. 
that I would have had and a very uncontrolled temperature there. This is what I came up with. It's huge because the fermenter that I've got is a really odd shape and it's taller than most and wider than most. So I had to change the dimensions a little bit and you can see just there, there's a little um, Arduino hanging off the side. So what I did, that's an inside view of it. What I did was I attached two of the Freetronics temperature sensors to their breakout shield and used their LCD shield and put this together. So there's two temperature sensors. One monitors the temperature of the fermentation chamber. The other one monitors the temperature of the ice chamber. Basically, it switches the fan on when the temperature in the fermentation chamber is above a threshold. In this particular case, the threshold was 18 degrees. Um, but I didn't want it to just switch the fan on because the problem with ice is ice melts. And I didn't want to be checking it every you get every 8, 12, 24 hours to find out whether the ice needed changing or not. That's why I put a temperature sensor in the ice chamber. It alerts a buzzer when the temperature in the ice chamber goes over a predefined threshold. At the moment, it's uh, about 6 degrees. Generally, once it goes over 6 degrees, the ice is just about depleted. Um, but there's a problem with the buzzer. My girlfriend doesn't really like things that are noisy, so she needed a way to shut it up. So I put in some additional code so that by pressing one of the buttons, you can shut the buzzer up. Now, it gives you a visual warning as well if it goes over the temperature threshold and displays an AL next to either the warp or the ice temperature, um, depending on which one's gone over the threshold. There is an alarm on the warp temperature, so if something goes horribly wrong and fan fails and the temperature in the fermentation chamber goes over a dangerous threshold, it will um, alarm. alarm. Um, there is an article on my blog which details everything that I went to and there's me filling the beer bottles in all my glory. Um, I do have some of the beer here with me. So it's great. <laughs> I had it last night. Yeah. Um, I have put the code on GitHub. It is really, really, really hacky. Um, it is definitely not the most elegant piece of code that I've ever put together. but. But it's shift code, and that's better than no code. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Hi>. <laughs> um, Patches accepted? <laughs> oh, if you, hey, if you, want to take, if you want to take my code and improve it, by all means, go right ahead. It's, um, it's a public repository. I'm too stingy to pay for a private repo, so... <laughs> um, if you want to go there and have a look at it, that's fine. Uh, at the end of the day, it was a solution that I put together, leveraging an Arduino because it's what I had on hand. Um, it is rather bulky. What I would like to do as the next sort of evolution from this is to take um, the work, I've forgotten which university it is, did some work with the AT Tiny processors and setting them up so that you can use them as an Arduino. I want to try and take a AT Tiny 85 and use a ship register to talk to the LCD and make this a heck of a lot smaller than it currently is because at the moment it hanging off the side of the box is rather bulky. It's not heavy, but you know, I, I'd like to use my development board and breakout shield for other stuff instead of having them permanently tied up. I mean, there's a few dollars worth of stuff hanging off the side of it. If I can take an AT Tiny, bang a few components on it, that's um, uh, a lot cheaper. And in my view, a better use of the, the, the hardware, I can take my 328 and go use it for other stuff. Using a 328 to control the temperature of beer is probably overkill. So, yeah, that's it. Great. Um, Jonathan is the guy responsible for designing and spending many, many hours um, standing beside his own CNC machine, cutting out the chassis for the CNC program.
Every, um, corner. every corner we can find, we cut it. Um, low cost plotter at its simplest point. Um, it's meant to be run next to your laptop on whatever desk you can find. So, um, yeah. Um, and obviously, Arduino control. We chose Linux CNC because it's got quite a nice sort of GUI interface which you can see things move. Um, and that's what it looks like when it's done, which everyone has one. That's good. Um, and so the next thing is sort of why do we build something like this? Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. We just wanted to get people interested in CNC and it's, it's a very easy way to get into something that kind of works. Um, I sort of think of it as an idea that groups like you guys can use it and we can get a classroom for them to sort of build them up and get you to a, the point where it works where you can pull it apart and rebuild it in whatever way you'd like. Um, limitations, you'll find these out pretty quickly. Uh, you can read through them if you want, but it's, it's the main problem is just that it's slow, it's noisy, there's threaded rods, they're rough, they roll, they do okay, but they're not great. It, everything is cheap, really, really cheap. Um, actually, one significant point there, sorry to interject. Says 3D parts take about three and a half hours to make. But you consider that there are 40 something kits that were made. Well, 55. 55 kits. There was well over 100 hours of 3D printer time went into the kits that you've Oh, okay. successful 3D printing. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the CNC took me, per kit is about, let me get one. Yeah, 25, 30 minutes of just CNC per kit as well. Three seventy dollar cutters, <laughs> and there was two other cheaper cutters as well that made really rough stuff that I had to check out. So <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. Look, I had a, had a friend running it, and yeah, he, he dropped a couple of them directly on screw heads, which makes the cutter just go. <laughs> <laughs> they look cool. <laughs> okay, so here's how it was sort of made. Um, I designed a lot of it in sort of completely not open source software, which I'm just going to call screw up. You can guess for yourself what it is. <laughs> you don't really like it. No. <laughs> it's got a pretty low barrier to entry and I kind of learned design stuff on the fly for other projects, I've just sort of stuck with it. Um, when you're doing this sort of stuff, you you take your, your 3D image and you turn it into um, G code, which is what Linux CNC understands. Now to do that, I use something else which is also completely not open source or free or anything like that, which is cam thingy. Yeah, sure that'll do. And when I cut it, um, I've got a home-built CNC machine made out of a thing called MDO, which is basically plywood with MDF cases, and then it's all impregnated in, in resin. But um, that's also it's kind of open source, but they want you to pay for it. You have to pay for it to get the prices, which doesn't really make it open source, really. But um, it is actually running Linux CNC. So I got one of, what was that, four things, which is actually open source, which, you know, okay. <laughs> and that's what it looks like. That's my machine, which I spent a lot of hours in that very leaky shed, standing behind, listening to it whine, and the dust extractor makes more noise than anything. Um, there was four bags of dust about that big when I finished. I have a power dust mask, which is great, because MDF is incredibly costless. And that's what the controls look like. The Starship Enterprise, some people have bought it, which is very generous. Yeah. Now, the plastic, which was also done in screw up, um, you cut it into, gee, anyone who's done 3D printing will know you just use a slice or a computer or whatever you like, really, just slice it up into, uh, into um, layers, because it's that way, and then the hack Melbourne Hacker Space was very generous in printing them. Um, the Prusa is mainly what we use simply because the build platform is large enough that we can fit a whole kit on, on that one in one run, basically. Um, and that's a kind of blur blurry photo of the main kit that was used, which is owned by John and Bosch. Uh, he printed about half of them, and then Andy borrowed it and printed the rest. So. Yes, um, it's a very serious 3D printer. 
I broke it twice. You broke it twice. You <laughs> engraved the, the aluminium plate for one. Should I have not said that? No, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> um, and that's that's on the spaces, Chris. I think Stuart, you used my photo. I used your photo. <laughs> that's what I had. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's a laying down the parts. Right. How so long one layer then? I have no idea. I mean, um, it lies. I mean, I've got a time to No, I get it. You know, it takes a minute for it to dry. Of course, all the, all the layers are different amounts of plastic, yes. but towards the end of the round, I know how I get through. I know about the end of it. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to very briefly on the other tracks, which I'll leave Link to do the rest of. Um, do you have any slides, or is that all you've got? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, yeah, no, I'll let you talk about that here. Um, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I just need to grab this thing from the other room. Okay, just have a look at that thing, isn't it? Yeah, is it, is it still what? I'm going to put this online if you want to go to GitHub. Um, okay, we could do that actually. Um, <laughs> no, you go, you don't? Know? Sure. Yeah, um, <laughs> so we've got WebEx and it's going to. Oh, stop. Sure. Yeah, we'll be online in a sec, so you can chat and I'll get online. Alright, so um, I don't really have anything to talk about until I get some, either get a picture or I get a board. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we've got this control board that controls the sensitive chain. Um, it's based on an Atmel 18 mega 4 uh, that's the same microcontroller that's used in the Arduino and Leonardo. Um, in the default machine that we ship people more good <coughs> using today, um, it has an Arduino and Leonardo bootloader firmware on it. So you use it with the Arduino IDE, just like an Arduino Leonardo. Um, but you don't have to use that firmware. You could blow it off and just write, you know, hardcore low-level ABR code if you wanted to. Um, you could run all sorts of stuff on it. Uh, yeah. Software is left as an exercise for you to play with. Um, so it's basically just the, the microcontroller and two stepper motor driver chips. Um, we're using um, TI, JRV, double eight, double ones. Um, they're only small stepper motor ICs. You know, they, they can maybe drive an amp or two amps into the stepper motor coils. Um, so they currently drive a moderately sized stepper motor. But again, this was something that was really optimised to be really, really cheap and simple. Um, other than that, on, on the board you've got um, a voltage regulator that generates a 5 volt rail from the 12 volt rail. Um, unfortunately, it would be nice if you could just plug the machine into USB and it would just work. But you can't get 10 watts out of a USB port, so you can't run these motors off a USB port, obviously. So you do need an external power supply. Um, we're just using 12 volts um, through a standard DC 2.1 millimeter jack, so that's really convenient. You can just use any old plug pack. If you didn't have one laying around or whatever, um, miracle. It's a miracle. Yeah. Oh, we're getting there. Better see more of all the holes. I couldn't find them. Oh, yeah. 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 Let's try this. Yeah. 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 Um, they just go straight into the, the micro. Um, 
You've got your um, stepper motor drivers here, um, two trim pots that adjust the current regulators in, in the um, in the stepper drivers, yes. I noticed when we soldered them in, we didn't have to adjust or do anything to them. Yeah, um, so when I you- I would have run them flat out, they told me I shouldn't be. Yeah, <laughs> well, when you, when you buy a trim pot just off the shelf factory stock like that, it comes set in the, the center 50% sort of position. And it just happens that we kind of got lucky with that, that it's a nice value at that point, um, which is good user experience. <laughs> um, so we've got two separate motors that are connected here, X and Y. Um, we have the servo, the header there. The servo header with a small hobby sort of servo like that, it's just five volts ground and a digital microcontroller pin, which generate, which takes a sort of uh, PWM signal into the servo. Um, there is spare breakout header here, which has step and direction, which is just two digital output pins and five volts ground and five volts. Um, that's used so you can add an extra stepper motor on the system, but you need to add the, the actual stepper motor driver electronics externally. Um, so it, it sort of has the capacity to be a three axis machine, but it was left off for cost constraints. Um, um, we've got an SD card there, um, SD card socket. Um, now, I don't know how well we've supported this in the software yet. I think the software is non-existent. Um, no, no, it doesn't exist. Card doesn't work. Yeah, software contributions welcome. Um, but basically, the idea was, we've got this SD card, we've got the touch screen, we've got the LCD display. So the idea was, with, with appropriate software, you don't need a PC, you could execute a program or a, um, a 3D plotting um, G-code or something autonomously off the, the SD card. And you, you just insert your SD card, boot up the machine, um, you, you get some feedback on the LCD and you hit the touch screen or something and off you go. Um, there are a couple of extra chips here. There's a 3.3 volt regulator and a, um, a non-inverting buffer to translate the logic levels down to 3.3 volts because SD cards are 3.3 volt SP over buses. Um, power comes in here, USB obviously. Um, that's an 8 bit latch that drives the um, LCD using only three pins on the microcontroller because you, it, you can just latch um, data in serially over three pins on the microcontroller and then connect the, the, the eight bits on the output side to your LCD and that that's perfectly fast enough for typical <coughs> updates on one of those Hitachi LCD alphanumeric displays and it saves you a lot of, um, lot of pins on your chip and, and that's just the standard register so it's, eight, um, it's like 20 cent part or something. Um, as I was saying, power supplied with a 5 volt output and 5 volt rail, um, SPI um, program interface for the AVR, that's pretty much it. Oh, there's some LEDs down here too. Um, and LCD contrast. LCD oh, contrast, LCD. trim pot, yeah. And the limit switches on top. Yeah, there's a, um, there's a spare set of pads up the top there for XYZ um, um, home position setting switches or limit switches so that the, um, the machine can set its um, user data. Yeah, e stop. Yeah, e stop, whatever. Um, they're just digital lines with a um, pull up, yes. Um, there are some inductors on the board. Is that the uh, I just lost the video, but anyway, there is an inductor which is the um, switch mode buck re regulated 5 volt output, yeah. With 12 volt or 5 volt plug in, how is it determining which um, one is it using? It actually board? just ties them together. It actually comes through a diode, so it won't inject power back into the USB port. Okay. Um, you, you will get a 5 volt rail from either the 12 volt supply or the USB. Um, so you you can use either or by connecting it up. Well, but we recommend the power supply as well because I've done What are we using for that? 3 for 6 3 it's cheap. It just works. Cheap. I know this is going to mind when I was unplugging this rotating motors that there was enough back in there to light the LCD back up. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Um, it, it depends what sort of architecture is obviously inside the, the H regions in the in the. Um... <laughs> Hopefully, we're not getting any um, you know compromising private information from Andy's email or anything. Uh, it's all compromising. Um, 
anyway, I, I lost track of where I was. Oh, here we've also got um, we've also got um, a spare header there with five bolts of ground and the the serial UART on the 32U4 um, because we're um, this is not a standard sort of um, ATM Mega 328 that you might be familiar with. It's a 32U4, so it's got the the USB hardware port on the chip. And so we're not using the, uh, the serial UART, so I just broke that out on a spare set of pads so it can be hacked to do other things. Um, there's also a reset button there on the board. You may notice that on the actual boards it doesn't exist because this is a later revision than the production boards. Um, wait, 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 tell them what they don't have. <laughs> <laughs> um, here there's a set of LEDs down the bottom there. Um, RX and TX, so that's just communications over the, the USB virtual UART for feedback and programming it. Uh, 5 volts and 12 volts, so you can see the status of both power rails individually and XYZ. They indicate when the three uh, home switches are, are closed. Um, you can actually just test that by sticking a bit of wire across, just short out those, those switch pads on the board, and you, what you should see is that the LEDs there will light up. If you don't have micro switches or whatever installed on your uh, machine. That's um, all that will happen. The code won't stop because it's not coded in yet. Because it's not it coded, coded in yet. It doesn't matter. Um, research, well, what happens if you keep pushing against the end? You're going to get <laughs> as it slams against so, so it's like the end. <laughs> the stable oh, motors will do it. <laughs> <laughs> the stable motors are pretty strong. It wouldn't surprise me if you, if you try and you probably break something. Yeah, probably. Yeah, no, Which is why you turn down the code. Yeah. Nah. Don't do it. That's easy. That's <laughs> <laughs> so a question. I yeah. mentioned before you were using the CNC to control. Yep. Uh, so how are you communicating the position to the chip? How are you closing uh, the loop and getting around the whole USB real-time from okay, the yeah. CNC? Some, someone in the US has written uh, a lovely little Python script that um, just acts as a link, yeah. basically. Oh, yeah. just so you just shunts it and moves through it rather than the server. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, There's no real, real time feedback loop, so it's not really precise mechatronics for closed loop. Yeah. yeah. You're talking about running this autonomously with the is What? Why am I connected? <laughs> I'm, I'm scared. Something might be in my box. Uh, sorry, Mitch, I, uh, right. I missed that. Um, yeah, so talking about running it autonomously, it's not going to be different with G code. If, you're not, if you've ever not the PC running EMC2, what's going to be different? Something like gerbil can. I mean, yeah. it's not that hard to interpret G code. I mean, you've got to write a lot of, a lot of rules for things like curves and arcs. But it can be done. It's, it's, it's a run gerbil on this? Um, I'm not sure. You I'm not sure if gerbil works on a Leonardo. Yeah, yeah. Can run, it? Oh, run, that, we ran We did run gerbil and Merlin. We ran Merlin as well, but that was on a ramp score on, a, on an older Mega. Yeah. Board. So we didn't test the Leonardo stuff that heavily. With that. Yeah, yeah that's, it's a very immature, untested idea. None of the software has been properly developed to do it yet. Um, it may be challenging to make it work, but it's an idea. What design software did you use? Uh, Eagle. Um, so the files are online on my GitHub account. Um, they're Eagle files, but they're um, Eagle, Eagle 5.0. Or six point something. Anyway, they're in the XML newer Eagle format, so you can use various tools to pass that XML, as you might probably be familiar with. You use Blazor for that thing, didn't you? Um, yeah, I can't I remember. remember the the I can't remember what the site's called, but it's it's a web-based. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, I noticed. I could, couldn't help but notice that there was a free trace name on board, so I went to the pre chronic website and found the uh, article on the website. <laughs> when they eventually become available, That's even a price will then. they be, yeah, they're really the price then. will they be the newer version with the reset button, or are we going to have, if we want to buy another one, because I actually want to take this board and use it for something a lot bigger than that. Um, with similar size centers, which will do what I need to do, um, but I'm going to want a reset button. Okay. Um, we've fabricated 100, so once those 100 are gone, then we'll um, do version 2 with the reset button. Okay. The other thing is that you can easily add a reset button yeah. through the ICSP. Okay, cool. Yeah.
Yeah. <coughs> or, or you can um, get a screwdriver or something and just poke pin 5 and pin 6 on your ASP. You know? <laughs> uh, do, do you remember, ever, ever worked with a, like a PC motherboard where it's just sitting uh, exposed on your table and you want to reset it, so you just poke it with a screwdriver and hit the reset pin? Yeah, and or you put it on the PC. Just grab an PC case and reset the reset button. Yeah, yeah that's the head of the jumper mm -hmm. already. We plug it just be real quick with the jumper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's called cool. Hexen. Yeah. Yeah. Just have yeah. to pull it lower. Um, yeah. Just, and pin 6 on the OSB header is ground, which is right next to the reset one. Um, any other questions? Yeah, um, you may remember last year at LCA we had the um, the Pebble thing and we said, oh, we're going to manufacture more and distribute them through free trainings. I put it up on the website and it never actually happened because there was never any more stock. But uh, hopefully this time we'll actually have it available. Well, we have the stock right now. We're getting close to every year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the designs are all there, so it's, it's can still happen. What about the other parts, the wooden bits? Um, yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because that was all done with, like, it was done in a really labour-intensive, manual, hand, lovingly crafted sort of way with love, with, um, with CNC yeah, reactors and 3D printers. printers and stuff. It was never really a good, it wasn't a sort of um, design for manufacturability, design for scalability sort of process. <laughs> yeah, but then again, we may be able to find some cheap contractor in China where we give them the, the STL or something and they injection mould a thousand little plastic gears or something. I don't know, maybe. This doesn't look like parts could run through a laser cutter and all of some hack spaces in Australia do have these parts. Yeah, there's, there's a DXF up there. The yeah. Well, um, Rob, have a chat to Rob Pritchard. He's actually known as a good laser cutting place that I get all my steel stuff done there, so. The other thing I was going to say is, if you want to do, uh, change the design slightly, you could always buy something like Maker Slide and uh, or 20 rails and basically make a whole frame arrangement yourself. It's not the cost. It's not hard to do. It'd be nice and rigid. There's all sorts of options. Oh, the big thing yeah, is, like once you've got the motors, you've got 80% of the shape. Yeah, so there are... Um, STLs and DXF files and various um, 2D and 3D um, CAD files that are open source for the actual mechanical chassis and the 3D printed stuff, as well as the hardware. Yeah. You mentioned the third, the third axis. Um, what, what is actually required to get a second motor driver? Is it just like a small breakout board for the chip or something? Um, yeah, um, actually there is. Oh, actually, before we get into any more questions, I'll just keep going. I've got a few pages on cell phone. I can't read what I wrote. If you guys know who's tired, but we'll see how we're interested. So this is going to be chaos unless we're really careful about it. Uh, so what we're going to do is, first off, the people who have pre-registered and you have names on the list, we're just going to make sure that you are here. And then after that, we will deal with other people that have come along that haven't pre-registered. We've only got a few um, sets of hardware and a little bit of space to accommodate extra people. So unfortunately, a few are going to be disappointed, but we'll do the best we can. So if you have pre-registered, please come along, see Andy, we'll mark your name off, and we'll know that it's all good, and then we'll work from there. Do, do it by calling. So anyone who's pre-registered today, or? Oh, I'm not You're better off doing it. Sorry, I'm basically calling it out. done anything this mechanical. It's been just PCB assembly. So. What we're going to do, the way we found this works really well, is if we have lots of helpers who give direct um, assistance as you're going, it's really hard to direct this sort of thing from the front because everybody goes at different speeds, you get hung up on different parts of the process. So we have a bunch of people who have already done assembly of these kits at the Hackerspace in Melbourne. They've run into the problems and figured out how to do it. So what we're going to do is have those helpers distributed around the room. If you've got any questions, ask people beside you, ask the helpers, and, um, and everybody can proceed at their own pace. Uh, this is not a race, so uh, be careful with it. Don't force things. If things don't fit quite right, uh, you know, we can make adjustments, and inevitably things won't fit. That's just the way it is. So we have some electronics assembly to do, some mechanical assembly to do. We have soldering stations all grouped down in that corner. 
So if some people wanted to begin with the electronics assembly, that's cool. You can go straight to that. There are really um, three main parts to this. There is the mechanical assembly of the chassis. There is the assembly of the electronics fitting the last few parts and wiring it together. And then following on from that, there is a software and making it all do what it needs to do. So most of you will probably start with the mechanical assembly of the chassis. Um, some of you can jump into doing the electronics and then come back and do the chassis later. That's probably the most sensible way to parallelize this. Uh, now, you'll need access to instructions. I notice that a lot of you don't have laptops. Um, but there are instructions. If you go to ArduinoMiniConf.org, there is a link to two sets of instructions. One is the instructions for the chassis, and another is the instructions for the electronics. Um, we're going to be a little bit cramped. That's the other thing is, Doing this sort of project, you need a lot more space than if you're just working on a PCB. Um, so just be considerate of the people around you. Um, we've basically fitted in as many people as we can in this room, but it is going to be tight. Um, if you don't have access to the instructions, like you don't have a laptop with you, um, we can... Sorry? Yeah, um, there's no way we can fit it all on the screen, but... We'll just put some up and put through it so you can get an idea. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. Those are our network. Good point. Here's my point. No, it's not. It's announcing the assembly needs to be contested. While this is still down here. Yeah, okay. We're going to set up a laptop with, um, with the documents on it. And if you've got the little flash drive that came in your rego, we can stick it on that for you. Oh, I thought this was the same. Yeah, you can. Mm. I, I reckon get that one out in the commentary, and then we'll start just have a look at what as people go. You'll see how the girl is. Yeah, yeah, I'd say. Get off, get off. Um, would you like some tips on solar? Yeah, I would. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> The idea, okay, solder, what you want is you've got two things that you want to join together. What you want is to solder between the two, which is going to act as a And so what we want to do is get that joint between the two hot, then apply the solder, let the solder flow, take the heat off, and let the solder set this head of here is a good example of what I can do to show you on one year and then you can do the rest. So you can put the header in. Yeah. Um, which, which way should we go like this? This will go onto the board here. So the header goes on the bottom so that it begins to go onto the board later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, how to get to it? Uh, I think I pulled it up. How are we going? Not quite so much wet wetting as it's called in CAD, so give that another give that another go. More solder or just melt yeah, it? Yeah, just a little bit of just try the heat first. Oh, pull away. Perfect. And that action is where you're dragging away like that's good yeah. actually because that helps it form. Yep. Yeah, that's that's flush pretty good. much on the money there. And one final sanding check. Yes. <laughs> So have a go at the next, the next one there. Yeah. Have to hold it large, but you probably actually grab the solder socket to have it away. So that hasn't taken up as much space as other ones. Yeah, you, could, you could give it another hit just with the hot heat if you want to try and wet it a bit more, but it it. it, it uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. 
I reckon leave it on there just a smidge longer than you've been doing it'll be pretty much on the money. Oh yeah, that's fine. Let's just keep it on there a smidge longer for the next one. At this stage you can actually just keep coming, coming down. Perfect. So what happens if it accidentally spills across though and then you've got too much solar? We, and um, there's ways we can pull put what's called a solar uh, bridge and we can... Sort of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Nice. It also looks like there's a couple of little things over there you obviously want to stay away from yeah. on the other side. Yeah, they're um, fires as they well. connect the top side of the print circuit board to the... It may be a, a matter of superstition, but I tend to skip in so that I don't get too much heat build up. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll do the odds and then even. Again, that's a matter. Hey. What are we building there? Uh, a hack CNC, hopefully. Which component are you working on? The Z axis of Harry. I was cracked with woodwork this year. My dad's a carpenter, a sixth generation carpenter. <laughs> Just being built. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what you meant. It's embarrassing. Someone's been designed. Bring it all in the same the same point. Excellent. Yeah. Yep. That's what it's really good. Yeah. So I'm going to just get that display out of the way because it actually doesn't need to be involved in this part of the thing. Okay. Well, that was cool, pretty kind of um yeah, it's right, pretty good. <laughs> Does it have to sort of roll the way around? Ideally, yeah, yeah. You, you can only compass that just by heating it up a bit. You probably won't need any more if you close it wrong. Yeah, 
Fit, it won't be too much of a problem. Uh, flip it over and flip it over. Just like that, yep. Better? Look, once, it's, once it's screwed in, it'll be, it'll be tied in place. So it's pretty... It's Virtually working. You do the y axis up and down, x axis, and the z axis. But it's not, it's not connected to the, uh, the real steppers yet, but when, when we're connected to the steppers in there, then it will be. You can see it on the screen there. I don't know how that works with the video. You can see the, this is the uh, axis. Right. Sorry, it's cool. Yeah, hacks in the Yeah. Okay. I'm tipping our montage into something to some music. We're using X, Y, and Z at home, which is really quite useful. Sorry. Are we getting the second one? This one is not the one. It's the X, man. Oh, right, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 Hello. G'day. <laughs> Don't mind me. So we need a lot of other Thank you. 
So you basically yeah. go, yeah. 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 They both yeah. basically, if one goes one direction, we push the other, yeah. the other way. Yeah. Hold space at the board, the board yeah. 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 So that just holds it firmly in another time. Yeah. 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 Um, just, uh, just take a sec while I get a couple of things set up. Just, That's all right. They had it on the, the station there. I just need to. basically just stops that piece coming off, mm -hmm. particularly if you accidentally if you pick it up here. It might pop off the edges, but it won't pop off the dry piece. No, I am <laughs> now recording, so at your leisure. So, yeah, so that might be the better way, um, but it's highly flexible. So Modbus is available, you can communicate with Modbus to many things. One of my jobs when I leave here is to go to a country town and interface a PLC with Modbus to a PC and capture the weight of that bale, but capture it with intelligence about what's going on in the machine. Because the problem is they press capture and the bales you know, already half loaded the bales and the weight's dropped, <laughs> it's useless. So if I can capture the weight when the bale's where it should be, and steady and all those sorts of things, and I can put little interlocking bits in the PLC and in the software between it, such that they've got to press F5, press F5, the bale loads. If they don't press it, the next bale doesn't load. <laughs> you keep sort of pressing the key and you've got the machine under control. Um, from the point of view of uh, your sort of things you might want to do, um, Jonathan has a I love a lovely super house with all these lights wired up and all these uh, uh, roller doors uh, working and all these sorts of things. And I assume he's used Python or Perl or some language like that to join it all together. But it's a lot of infrastructure, a lot of custom code every time. You can write a very simple little machine in here that says, here's an output, here's an input, here's a light. 
here's some rules, you know, I don't want to be on for more than 15 minutes, or I've got an IR sensor in the place of the IR, IR sensor is on for more than, or off for more than 10 minutes, turn the light off. In the config file, he would just simply uh, say we were going to create that. Uh, let's go up top here. He would some, say something like um, room, room one, and he would call it um, simple light. And he might say, look, I'm going to put it in um, you know, general for the tab, for the, for the web page. But of course, uh, you can write your own web page. The system uses a thing called zero EQ for all of its general communications between all of its connector programs. Uh, we hope to add, uh, make the, well, in fact, it is already very, uh, very simple. The um, zero, uh, QMTT stuff has been fairly well integrated into clockwork in the sense that not only of those points I mentioned, there's also this idea of um, subscribe and, re and receive commands such that you can say to a machine, uh, a machine I want to receive something and, when I, and I subscribe to something and then when I receive a message I can process that in my state logic. But so we've got this here and then you say um, uh, light or room, room, one, switch one and room, room one light. He's now got his room configured. Yeah, no more work, standardized program. If he wants to write a simple, more complicated thing that takes advantage of other information, that's a simplified thing as well. And it's just a set of passed in parameters. We also do the idea of, um, within our machine, we'll do an um, instantiation of a persistent Variable. So when we, we can generate the, the idea of persistent, uh, really are we? Okay. Well, I'll just quickly show you. The call. Okay. We have this idea of persistence. So we can uh, say to a machine, um, your options, your variables are now persistent, and they get stored in a little database. Every time the program wakes up, that information gets reloaded into that machine's context, and result timers. Anything like that can be uh, stored a number of times. The lights can turn on and off. <laughs> It'll be stored forever. <laughs> you know that kind of stuff. So let's have questions. Any questions, Mike? Hey, so, Troy. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman in the middle of the back there. So you code on GitHub zero. Yes, right. Yes. Um, it's as I say. Uh, what license? Uh, GNU 2, I think. Yeah. Uh, so we've got um, the Laprop project there, uh, and we've got this thing we're calling InQuino, InQuino, uh, which is the code we're writing for here, uh, which is this generic way that you don't have to know anything about code, you just load it on there, and then you can start to use it. Um, this here is, a, I tried to show you, is a simple driver board that drives uh, these solenoids and takes inputs uh, just using a voltage divider from the 24 volts. So would you say this is like a better Fermata basically? I didn't catch the last part. Fermata? Program. Like uh, it's Fermata, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it's right here. Yeah. I've not seen the Fermata. Okay. So Fermata is like a piece of firmware you put in, it lets you drive everything from the computer. What I find interesting here is like all, so it's all event driven instead of being simply the, the IBM. So I, I, I have a so, but the, the things what would be interesting in the comparison is see like performance wise or feature wise is it like we will eventually right? get I hope it's everything that sell yeah. it, I well I, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll get to the point where we can control every single peripheral that's on these devices um, and gather information from them it's event driven we I have a real peeve any I don't like things that pop I hate yeah, that so uh, everything is event based is um, it a PHP interface using the event uh, no that's just Hand coded PHP with, with HTML in the thing. It's not secure in any sense at this stage, but it's just using zero MQ uh, PHP bindings. Um, and you can list objects. So, what we did was. Um, uh, do I still run that up? Yes, I can. Uh, no, I can't. I'm well, we can talk after. Yeah, but um, we've got this idea if you can log into a shell and you can describe a machine which tells you what the state of all the inputs and outputs are. 
Um, there's a ZMQ listener, basically, so you can see all the messages that are being sent throughout the system. Um, you know, we had the machine that um, I just ran up just there, just to give you an idea of the, um, um, uh, this machine. This is a machine here that we, we did. It's, uh, if I run that I'll, I'll come talk to you yeah. after, because yeah. I think, I think they want just to Just quickly things. look at that. That's not, uh, I don't know if that one more to it. Yeah, that is 541 active machines with 319 passive machines running, running on a 1.6 gigahertz atom machine and did the job on this back off IO. Uh, at a one millisecond update on all IO points, uh, about 250 IO points. Um, uh, plus a video camera for capturing bale pictures at the head of bales. Uh, we had a piece of Python code running that displayed all that in the pop queue type system, all driven from here from the point of view of messages being passed and all that kind of thing. So it's, it's very flexible, um, I think. Um, and I believe it sh we couched it wrong when we were talking about it for the Linux conference, but you know, uh, if I couched it this way, I think a lot, a lot of people would enjoy it. So, thank you. Uh, um, yes, I'm from Melbourne, but now I live in China. Um, some things you can get really cheap in China, like electronic parts. This is a touch screen, it comes out of a Nintendo DS, and there's a little connector on your hack CNC boards that lets you plug in a touch screen would let you play around with the touch screen without having the PC connected in theory. Okay, so um, these guys are recipes from the DS. The idea is to touch it somewhere on the screen and you can read the little values out the little tail on the end of it, the tail. Yeah, little tail there. And, and you can use that in your application. Now, the way touch screens work is Um, if you have a resistor here, you can set up a resistor divider network. So the idea is, as you move this up and down, you're going to get a varying voltage there. Now, a touch screen is a layer of glass and a layer of plastic. And there's a very small air gap between them. When you push with your finger, the two layers will touch each other. And if you touch it up near the 5 volt end, because you get a uh, varying voltage across there. If you touch it near the 5 volt end, the bottom uh, plate will be close to 5 volts. If you touch it near the 0 volt end, it will be close to 0 volts and you can read that voltage off there. Alright, okay. Now, the <laughs> you, won't, you won't see that in uh, PowerPoint. No, okay. Yes, so when we have our little touch screen, we have four wires, one along each edge that come out of this little tail here. So Top, bottom, left, and right. When we're reading the X, <coughs> yes, um, what we do typically is set this to say zero volts, this wire to five volts, and then we use the bottom wire as our sense wire to see where it's been touched, like the resistor divider we said saw before. To read Y, uh, we do the same thing, except now we make the top zero, the bottom five volts, and we read off one of the side wires. Now the thing, that lets, uh, the thing that lets us do that is that inside the AVR chip that's inside every Arduino and also in the hack CNC boards that you had today is that, okay, here's the chip with a number of uh, uh, I.O. pins on the side. You can set different modes for these pins. So you can set a particular pin to be high so it can provide 5 volts. You can set it to be low so that it will uh, uh, it'll be 0 volts on here. You can make it so that it's not connected to anything or you can read the voltage that's there on the pin. Now, when you're reading those uh, voltages, it's a 10 bit converter, so you get a signal from, you get a number from 0 to 1, 1 or 2, 3 that you can read with your software. All right, so, so the idea is that you set up those pins for uh, 5 volts and 0 volts and reading off it for X, you read the sense wire, uh, you set that up for Y, you read the sense wire for Y, you do something with that data, and then we'll all, we'll all go back up to the top because it'll be really fun. All right, now, 
Um, what got me started with this was partly some stuff that John wrote in his lovely book, Practify and Dream Home, and also some stuff that Andy did uh, when we realised that uh, we've got a project that's got a bunch of switches and they cost money and it ends up adding up. So the idea is that you take a touchscreen like this and if you want to have three or four buttons or something like that, what you do is you get some card, you print out on the card the buttons that you want, you slip them under the touchscreen and that becomes your uh, interface. Now, these guys are made of glass. So if you drop them, they break. And then we all cry. And also, if you slip them into the little connector on your CNC board and then you put the little latch on and then you have that hanging off, the little tails can break off very easily and they don't work very well when you break the tail off. So, yeah, apart from that, you get lots of good fun. Where can you get one? Well, the good news is, everybody who made a hack CNC today, I have a touch screen for you. Um, I live in Shenzhen, China. I can walk two, down, two minutes down the street into the world's largest electronics market, which is pretty damn cool. And they're one of the spoils of the uh, new thing I'm Plus, they're probably to Australia. Yes, I did bring them here. I'm not in detail. All right, okay. Um, you can also buy them from online gadget sellers, for example, Good Luck Buy. They're only about $3, including shipping. Uh, if you want help using them, get to your local hacker space, or you can read John's fine book, Practical Arduino. Uh, this particular chapter, I think, is also online. Lots of good info there. Um, yes, uh, thank you for listening to my lightning talk. And uh, yes, my name is Mitch. So if you've got hack CNC, you come and see me. <coughs> I'll give you one of these touch screens. Thank you. Right, software. Um, here's a very quick run of how you actually get something out of it. Um, the best way is to just have a go with Inkscape because um, if you've got the ISO that we, we had loaded up, um, that's installed with the G code extensions, um, draw your picture. Use the export to G-code tool. Um, I found on my machine a negative access, a negative Z-axis movement was enough to push it down with enough force to hold the pen. You're going to have to play a little bit, unfortunately, because everyone's a little bit different. Um, and then just load the file in Linux CNC and hit the big start button. Um, oh, and we've got a few ideas on <laughs> how you can take it to the next level. Um, Freaking laser beams is very, very common. We don't have any at the moment, so it's unfortunate. Um, so what I did put up there, actually, I wonder if I was to use it to run an old um, a knitting machine, which takes a uh, punch card, sort of replace that to, to run on something a little bit more modern. So that'll be fun. Um, yeah, th there's a fair bit, or oh, there's a lot you can do with it. I mean, I, I would highly recommend replacing the rails if you ever get the chance or know how to do that. It's just so that it runs a bit smoother. Um, and that's the last of my slides. So now we can do questions. Oh, I should say a big thank you to everyone at the hack, hack space and the electronic team. Everyone involved with this, there was a lot of people. Um, there is a list of them on the documentation, which I'll let my name on. So, um, yeah. questions? I guess just on behalf of the attendees, we'd like to thank all the organisers and uh, all the work that all you guys did to put it all together and make these kits available for us. So. Yeah.
Um, so yeah, that's the place to go if you want to discuss any further ongoing um, questions or anything. Okay, and the GitHub, of course, which is slash CCHS hyphen Melbourne slash AxCNC. You'll remember that, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's on the documentation. Just one more question about the, the board. The server servo output, is that a direct route back to the processor? Or yes. Is that, so it's so you intended can... to drive a narrow use case, which is a very small five-volt hobbyist servo, like the sort of thing you use to control the control surfaces in a little plane. But if you're using something like a laser, you could hack a code to just toggle it on or off, yeah, have yeah, it to just fed or something yeah. like that. It's, it's yeah. directly off the micro, so yeah, a transistor or some sort of driver uh, circuit would yeah. be yeah. a little MOSFET <laughs> driver that uh, Freetronics so. <laughs> <laughs> For example. For example. <laughs> yeah. I've used tools on that thing I've been talking about. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I might just mention us on page chat and how we can well, I guess this is the end of um, our, what we formally planned, and there's a sort of I've got room to clean up, and the people will quite, will quite finish their machines. So I think what we'll do is we'll uh, uh, come to a close, um, start to uh, help anyone who needs a little bit of help just cross the line, start to pack up. Uh, we'll have dinner, we'll think about it, and we'll announce how, that, how we'll go, go forward on LCA chat. I think that's that's for them. So we'll put up URLs that people mentioned.